when I think about affordable housing, I think about um, housing that is accessible to everyone that lives in those neighborhoods. It's accessible, it's, um, you're not living above your means. Um, you're able to um, enjoy um, taking care of your children without having it be a burden or uh, it's no longer a paycheck to paycheck or in some of our cases it's whenever you get a check you were lucky. I think at a kind of human level affordable housing is housing that um, you feel comfortable living in and doesn't make life stressful because of how expensive it is. Affordable housing is not having to really be worried about how you're going to take care of your rent for the next month or if you're going to be able to stay throughout um, throughout the time that you need to, to stay in that in that place. My name is Kimberly. Uh, me and my family have lived in Minneapolis for over 25 years. Uh, I wanted to share this story because housing is one of the most important components of living a really successful and fulfilling life and it's been one of the most important reasons for my success and my positive trajectory in life and I've seen the effects bad housing has had on people's lives. We're at Sumner Field Heritage Park uh, public housing and we lived here for how many years Renee? Like two? About two years in the 90s. Nine years old when we moved in here, 10 years old. 10, Kim was two, yeah. three. The places were really nice. You know, you got the upstairs, you got the downstairs. And a lot of people don't really understand how tough it is for some people to have that foundation in order to do better in life. And the irony of it um, is just, it. I don't know what to say about it because I think back to when, you know, my mom and I and, you know, my sister and my family, we lived at the Sumner Housing Project, you know, um, as kids. And we lived there right at the end, right before they tore them down. And this was a, a whole entire housing project of low income housing for everyone. So they tore this project down and they moved everyone out and they had the choice of either the Section 8 um, housing voucher or what was called scattered sites. Um, public housing had specifically owned certain houses within the city and you could pick one of those scattered sites. And so that's what my mom chose or whatever. And um, so we moved off. We, we lived in a, in a pretty decent house in North Minneapolis. Um, when it came time to leave from that place, my mom ran into a lot of issues because her rent was $17 a month. About Section 8, um, a lot of times people aren't put into the best housing arrangements when they have housing choice vouchers and things. What is the city doing to, you know, raise the quality of living for people that have vouchers and housing choice? Yeah, so um, Section 8 is run and facilitated by the Minneapolis Public Housing Authority. Ah and they get their money from the federal government and they're a separate entity from the city, although uh -huh. they used to be directly connected to the city. Gotcha. So the city doesn't own it op and operate our own housing. We haven't since the early 80s. Yeah. That's basically it, you know, because the need for housing is so high, people are accepting um, basically whatever they can get, which is kind of where I am now. You know, I'm um, living in a two bedroom apartment in South Minneapolis. Um, it's ran down completely. There is an infestation problem. Um, the landlord is aware of it. He, uh, you know, tries to like exterminate at least twice a month, but I've been there for like two years. The problem is still the same. So that lets me know that you're aware he doesn't fix anything. And like, um, I'm currently on section eight. Um, at a point this year, I was without work. And so I got a little behind on the rent. The summer came, it was excruciatingly hot. Um, I told the landlord the air conditioner isn't working. I asked him to replace it. He said, yeah, when you catch up on your rent, I'll give you a new air conditioner. But because I'm on this housing program, there's a certain standard of living that he's supposed to adhere to. And there's nobody to regulate that, to say that, hey, no matter whether she's behind or not, you know, you have um, things that you can do if you want to evict her, you know, that's an option. You don't just get to withhold the air conditioner. One of the other intricate uh, places within the community is reassuring that residents not only stay and exist within this environment today, mm -hmm. 
but also when we start talking about uh, some of the various factors that have pushed people out of the community, how do we re-attract re some of those same individuals and in bringing the culture and maintaining and keeping the culture that sort of resides and, and looks like uh, the community where it was 10, 15 years ago, as well as uh, into the future. Uh, some of the ways of trying to sustain those things are through a wide variety of different uh, subsidies. Um, I don't necessarily look at it as a negative thing, but I think it's, it's critical in reassuring that everybody has an opportunity to exist. I really, really, really died for this um, Section 8, or as they call it, Housing Choice Now. Um, I waited 16, 17 years. I did everything I could do to get on the list. Um, they pretty much told me, you only have one kid, um, you have a pretty decent employment history, you generally have a job, so you're not eligible. So I had to um, find different loopholes and avenues to finally be able to get on a list. And so now that I have it, I feel like I'm really trapped. There, there are so many stipulations and rules and clauses and different things, and I just feel like... Um, I don't really have an a, a advocate, a worker, somebody that helps me understand the rules of these things, how it varies from city to city. I'm constantly trying to find the different information for myself. And then also the landlords are unwilling to accept it. And I believe that everyone in this housing market that works within Section 8, they know this. And that's why they changed the name from the Section 8 program to the Housing Choice Program. And landlords know that that it's the same thing and they're just unwilling to accept it at this point. Um, Section 8's gotten a really bad rap. This empty area right here is like actually where the park was and our home was right like where the bridge is at. Oh wow, I didn't even know that. Yeah, so there were other um, Sumner apartments there. There are some apartments up the hill called City View. Those are still there. Mm -hmm. I've never seen them remodel them. I, they're probably pretty much still the same. Mm -hmm. And then there's another complex, which is next door to Bethune Elementary School, about just two blocks over. And they have remodeled those and they look very nice. And I actually know someone from the Sumner Olsen days that lives over there and she is in low income housing now. I believe all of Cecil Newman apartments is still low income housing. Increasingly um, and historically, public housing uh, has been attacked, whether uh, from a narrative level, right, um, uh, or you had uh, public housing that, uh, that was designed really well, but then not built really well. And all of this, I think, contributed to a, a real distrust of public housing, housing and, and a real, I think, de uh, degradation of the, pub, of the public brand, right? Yeah. You know, uh, if you want to grow somebody out, all you have to do is like, you know, make some reference to a public bathroom, yeah. right? And, and and all of a sudden, you know, uh, uh, people are like, ooh, that sounds gross. I think that public housing, um, it has, uh, it started to receive um, uh, sort of a bad name, which then turned into less funding, uh, turned into a tax on public housing, uh, which turned into stigma, and you know that's sort of uh, some of the historical context. Overall bad treatment. Right, and overall bad treatment, mm -hmm. where if you are living off of public assistance or you're living in public housing, then the people who facilitate that housing um, uh, feel like you're, you're lucky to have anywhere to live, mm -hmm. uh, and this and this just sort of continues the cycle. One. One of my core values, something that I really try to implement in my work is equity. I, I grew up with a single father and he raised me and my sister. We lived all over the north side and at one point uh, we were in a one bedroom. He gave us the, the bedroom and, we, and he had the, the living room. And imagine how hard that can be for a single dad to, you know, have um, a personal life <laughs> uh, <laughs> with that kind of housing arrangement. Uh, he, we actually did wound up uh, owning a home in North Minneapolis uh, for about 10 years. And that was 
those 10 years were probably some of the best years I had in school. <laughs> I personally believe there's the initial role of meeting the needs of the client or the community through uh, being, in, being the more of an interpreter um, and conveying information uh, conceptually through uh, working drawings to actually have something built. Uh, the, also, the other thing that's very critical in the process is being able to take a client's vision and making sure that it's well thought out and directed through the construction drawings as well as informing and engaging the community through the process. Well, Common Bond actually started out of the Catholic Church. Um, it was born from the Archdiocese and um, it was in the 60s, kind of in the midst of um, the social justice movements that were taking off at the time. And our founders saw housing as a fundamental social justice problem um, because it feeds into so many other inequities. So our motto is stable homes, strong futures, vibrant communities. Um, and this idea that home's the foundation for everything in life. Um, it's nearly impossible to be successful in school and in a job and you know do better for yourself if you don't have a stable base to come home to. Um, kids who go to school and can come home and know that they have a place to sit down and study rather than I don't know whose house I'm going to be staying at tonight. They, they do better and the generational impact is huge too. Um, so, so many of our properties have a wait list and it often gets to the point where the wait list is so full that we have to close that. And so really a lot of times it's, it's a win if we even get to the point where we're able to open a wait list, which I think really speaks to the need of, for affordable housing in the area because so many people need it and can't receive it. Um, people are considered rent burdened if they pay more than 30% of their income on rent and the number of people that do is just astronomical. Can you tell me a little bit about gentrification that's going on here in the north side? Well, gentrification is really something that's happening all over the city yeah. and in most major uh, cities across the country, uh, but it happens in different ways. And I would say that the way that it's manifesting in the north side is that folks are uh, uh, lacking access to ownership, mm -hmm. uh, uh, lack access to um, capital that would put them in a position to own, whether that be property or a business uh, and other forms of you know, asset building that would allow folks to really build long-term wealth. What are we doing, what is Minneapolis doing to prevent displacement? Well, I think fortunately you have an, uh, uh, a lot of council members who are interested in this topic. We're being sensitive to the ways in which the market's changing and we're doing our best to come up with policies to combat that. Yeah. And not just myself, but um, uh, other council members are working on uh, a way for building owners to have to um, give an advance notice uh, of sell of their building. That way, they can't sell their building right from under their tenant's nose. Um, and it would also build in some protections so that when a building's sold, the new owner can't just snap their fingers and, dis and, and evict all of the tenants for no reason. Yeah. Another thing that I'm working on with uh, Council President Bender is uh, what we're calling a tenant bill of rights. We're taking five policies and we're packaging them into one that would hopefully um, uh, do, go a long way in preventing folks from getting kicked out mm -hmm. of their place. And so, uh, and so we're coming up with an ordinance that would, uh, for instance, put a cap on um, the fees that you can be charged when applying for uh, a, a place to rent. That would put a cap on security deposits. You know, some landlords say you got to have first month's rent, last month's rent, and a security deposit. Yeah. If this is a thousand dollar, this is a, a place that costs a thousand dollars, which would be cheap. Mm -hmm. You've got to have three thousand dollars cash on hand, Unrealistic. and just so few people actually have yeah. that. So putting a cap on security deposits is is really important. Instituting moving fees, mm -hmm. saying if you're going to make somebody move out under a certain uh, under certain conditions, that That's you're going to have to put up as the as the landlord, you're going to have to put up um, money to help them move yeah. uh, and get their stuff ready to uh, uh, ready to go. Mm -hmm. Um, I could rattle off all the policies, but I think a really important one is one that is kind of colloquially, colloquially known as just cause eviction. Uh, it, would, it basically means that for folks who are on a month-to-month -month rent, month-to-month uh, -month lease, your landlord would, would, have to have a, um, would have to have a very clearly defined reason that we would then sort of pre-prescribe uh, 
uh, as to why they're not renewing your lease. Anytime that money order arrived on the second day of the month, the third day of the month, anytime that money order was late, they would give her a UD, an unlawful detainer. And so although, you know, the rent was very cheap and she was able to afford the rent, you know, if she was busy and she left the money order sitting on top of the TV or something, she forgot to get it into the mail, she has an unlawful detainer. So we look up, you know, four or five years later and we're ready to move and my mom has five unlawful detainers. And so she became homeless for many, 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 many years after that because of those unlawful detainers. As a matter of fact, we moved in 1997 to the scattered site housing and my mom just got the UDs expunged from her record last year or this year. She's been pretty much homeless all this time. Every 100 people who qualify for housing assistance, only 30 percent actually receive it. Um, I think that speaks a ton to the need for affordable housing, um, and not just new construction either, preserving what's already there and not allowing um, developers to come in and purchase it and turning it into a luxury community. Um, that's another thing that we really focus on is buying and preserving what we call naturally occurring affordable housing. Um, and that just means that the apartment building was already below market rate once we stumbled upon it and so we purchase it and we keep the rents low. Um, that way other people don't come in and buy it and raise them, displacing tons of people which has happened a lot. Everyone deserves a level playing field and I think just Acquiring and being able to have the basic need of affordable housing is only, is, is, it's a natural step. Um, another thing that I think is really important is that a lot of times people tend to pity or sympathize with others who may not have what they have or have as much or, you know, whatever that means. Um, but it, it's not about pity or sympathy, it's really more so about understanding what they're going through and doing what needs to be done in order to um, make it better in the future. Well, one more policy and one more program that I want to I mention, the policy is uh, inclusionary zoning. Yes. So right. inclusionary <laughs> zoning, I love that, yes. Uh, inclusionary zoning is a policy that would you know, we got to work out the details, but essentially it would say that if you're going to be building new housing, you have to include a certain percentage of affordable in the yeah. unit. Right now, that completely falls on us, right? We can demand that, um, that, a, uh, that a landlord uh, uh, put some affordable units in it, and they're going to say, sure. And they're going to put their hand out and say, give me my subsidy. Um, and if they're going to lose money on a building, maybe that's fair, but if they're not, and if they can provide affordable housing, uh, a certain percentage of affordable housing in their building while still making the numbers work, then, then I think that developers should be doing their, uh, their, their share, uh, their work to support the city in developing more affordable housing. You can condemn that property. You can revoke that person's license, but then what happens to the tenant? They have to leave. And in a housing market that is uh, about 2% vacancy, which for folks that don't know, 2% vacancy uh, is, that's what's causing our housing crisis, right? You, you need to have a 5% or 7% vacancy in order to have a healthy market where, uh, uh, where landlords have to compete for tenants. Right now, we have a market where tenants have to compete for landlords. Very true. And, uh, and, so, uh, and so by clamping down on uh, slumlords, which is a good thing, we also end up displacing people and not leaving them with a lot of options for where to go. The Emergency Stabilization Pilot Program is a program uh, that, uh, that, that we've designed that says if your building um, has been condemned or if the city has come in and uh, revoked the license for your landlord, we're going to have a small stable housing where we can then place you under those emergency situations. What role do you think you play in meeting the needs of your clients in the community and what exactly do you think those needs are? So we typically like to look at the larger perspective of the community in which we're doing work. Um, oftentimes in a lot of urban environments, there's a lot of voids, needs, through a number of different things. And usually it's, um, sometimes it's job related, sometimes it's uh, a lack of amenities, sometimes it's housing, um, you know, are there parallels with education? Um, one of the great things that I like to try to do is look at um, 
bringing a, a holistic approach to uh, some of the projects that we work on. So if it's mixed-use development, we oftentimes like to uh, complement the housing with some type of need that's, that's actually uh, well thought out in terms of what's, what's needed for the community. Common Bond Housing built an entirely brand new building in Mankato. I've never been out there. I, I don't know anything about it. Um, but I saw where I was able to get the three bedroom that I needed for my family with my voucher. And so I was like, to heck with the job, to heck, you know, with the school, the kid can start over. We're just going to move out there and it's going to be great. And they denied me mm -hmm. because of um, my background and, you know, different reasons and stuff like that. But um, that's how frustrating the housing search is to where I was just like, I don't care about anything else. I just want to live somewhere where there's not stuff crawling in my kitchen or I just want to live where the toilet seat isn't. You know, or it just it just looks good. I mean, everybody on TV and everywhere you go, they got this nice carpet and the walls are freshly painted and beautiful. Everybody wants to have something nice. And I just really wanted, you know, like a nice branding place for my family. And I was willing to give up everything for it. And they still told me no. It's, it, I think it's the responsibility of not just um, us as residents and citizens of Minneapolis, but also the people that work here developers, architects, housing policy coordinators, things like that. I think it's all of our responsibility to make sure that we all are on a level playing field and we establish a community to make sure we're all thriving, we're all doing good. My ideal neighborhood would be um, better, more luxurious housing in my neighborhood at a price that I can afford with all of those wonderful, fun things and people around. What would you say are your aspects of an ideal neighborhood? What matters to you? So what matters to me in an ideal neighborhood yeah. is number one, identifying and creating different environments and spaces that consist of uh, an ideal home. In uh -huh. some conditions, it may be apartment style living, some places it may be uh, a condo, it may be a townhome, it may be a single family home. Well, I think that my ideal neighborhood looks like a lot of things. One is that, uh, and I said this before, but I think it's really important that the people who have chosen to make a, a, a place a place should be the ones who get to benefit from improvements to that place. They should be the ones who get to own those businesses. They should be the ones who have access to the transit. Um, they should be the ones to have access to beautiful parks um, and youth programming. My ideal neighborhood is a place where, um, where people feel like they can breathe a little easier because um, their circumstances aren't dire, right? It's not a matter, matter of survival. I would love um, for folks to, my ideal neighborhood has plenty of leisure time because I actually think that being able to have the time to invest in relationships and build community is an important part of how, um, uh, 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 how people keep themselves out of dire situations. My ideal neighborhood, uh, since my background is in design, it has to look pretty. <laughs> it has to look nice, it has to be clean, it has to have a bit of organization to it. And it has to have really great people. People people are so important when it comes to living in a healthy and thriving neighborhood. Um, without that, then, I mean, what's, I wouldn't say what's the point, but without it, it's really, it's incomplete. Um, Another part of my ideal neighborhood, accessibility, uh, transit, access to food, parks. I love parks, nature. My background is also in sustain sustainability. And if there are no, if there are no trees, if there's no greenery, if there's nowhere I can just take a walk and experience nature, then it just makes it a lot harder to appreciate where I live. 